Good morning, church family. Today, we are going to be concluding our journey through the Old Testament book, Jonah. Our reading comes from Jonah chapter 3, verse 10, and we're going to continue that reading through the end of chapter 4. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he said he would do to them, and he did not do it. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew you're a gracious God, and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he could see what would become of the city. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might shade him over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die, and said, It is better for me to die than to live. That God said to Jonah, Do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, Yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle? This is God's word. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Almighty God, I thank you for the gift of your word and the power your word. But today, as we study your scriptures, may your spirit shine light where there is darkness and bring forth life where there is death. God, give us ears to hear your voice, to see and behold the face of Jesus. Give us hearts that respond with faith, with love, and obedience. Lord, encounter us today through your word, by the power of your spirit, that we might understand and know your amazing grace that we might share it with a world in desperate need of it. It's in Christ Jesus' holy name that I pray these things. Amen. Amen. You can have your seat today. In the midst of his ministry, Jesus once told a rather famous parable about a father and his two sons. Many of you are no doubt familiar with how the story goes. The youngest son demands that his father would give to him an early inheritance when the son receives that sum of money, that great amount of wealth, he squanders it almost immediately. He indulges his every appetite and his every desire and urge. Very quickly, he is brought to the brink of poverty, brokenness, and self-inflicted suffering. The young son wakes up to the reality of his situation and he decides to humble himself to return back to the home of his father in hopes that he could at least find a place there, even if it's just to work as a lowly servant in the house of his father. But as the son returns home, he finds that his father is waiting for him. As the son comes over the horizon, the father gets up and he runs to his son. He embraces his son. He wraps his son in his own robe and throws a feast to rejoice that his son, who was once lost, has now been found. Such is the love of our Heavenly Father for all of his children who turn away from their sin and draw near to him. However, that is not where the story of the prodigal son ends. After all, there is another brother, the older brother who is hard at work in his father's fields. When he returns to his father's house to find that there's a feast that is honoring his wayward brother, he burns with indignation. He refuses to go in. 
He refuses to participate in this feast. He refuses to celebrate that his brother, who was once as good as dead, has now come home. So the father comes to find this elder brother. He pleads with him. He says, son, lay down your pride. Lay down your anger and come inside and enjoy the feast. And then, without a conclusion, the story abruptly ends. Jesus purposefully leaves this parable on a bit of a cliffhanger. After all, Jesus is not just telling the story in general. He's specifically aiming it at Pharisees and scribes, the religious leader of Jesus' day. Religious leaders who are criticizing Jesus, mistrusting Jesus, and are suspicious of Jesus because so many sinners and tax collectors seem to be flocking around Jesus, and Jesus allows them to draw near to him. He's speaking to these religious leaders because they embody the very spirit of the elder brother. And like the father of the parable, Jesus is inviting them to lay down their pride and come and to enjoy the feast of God's grace. You see, this parable shows us more than just the extravagant nature of God's grace. It also shows us in a very brilliant and moving way that there are two types of lostness. There's, of course, the lostness of self-indulgence, of purposely discarding the commands of God and going our own way, going headlong into death and destruction. This is the lostness of the younger brother, the lostness of who we call the prodigal son. But just like there is a lostness that is defined by self-indulgence, there is also a lostness that is defined by self-righteousness. This, of course, is the lostness of the elder brother. It's cold, calculating, and critical. It's judgmental and indignant. Without love and without grace, it is a spiritual posture that recoils at the notion that God would give his love and his favor to those who are unworthy of it. I bring this familiar tale to you because throughout the story of the Old Testament prophet Jonah, Jonah has somehow managed to embody the lostness of both brothers. He is both the younger brother and the older almost simultaneously. As the younger brother at the beginning of the story, Jonah willfully rejects the command of God and instead goes his own way. He is called by God to go east to the city of Nineveh to preach there, but instead he boards a boat and sails to the westernmost edge of the known world. Jonah spurns God's goodness and follows his own desires, and his desires only lead him to destruction and death. God sends a fierce storm upon Jonah's ship until Jonah must tell the ship and the, the, the crew that is aboard the ship that he must be cast into the sea in order for the waves to subside. They Obey Jonah's words with great fear and trembling, and the winds and waves immediately do become still. But Jonah sinks into the depths. God appoints a fish to save Jonah, and there in the depths of the waters, he is suddenly swallowed alive. And there in the belly of the fish, he vows to obey the Lord, to worship the Lord. And God shows Jonah grace. He is saved. He is safely returned to the dry land, albeit in a rather unpleasant manner. By unpleasant manner, I mean that he was vomited onto a beach. But then the word of the Lord comes yet again to Jonah. God commands Jonah to preach to the city of Nineveh, the capital city of the brutal Assyrian nation. Jonah obeys, and he gives really a rather half-hearted sermon of only doom and judgment. He, he preaches without even mentioning the name of God. He preaches only judgment without a call to action. Nevertheless, God uses the words of his wayward prophet to spark a spiritual revival in the heart of an empire bent on violence and evil. Yet, as we will see in this final passage of this book, Jonah is actually scandalized by this turn of events. Once the younger brother, who was unworthy and a recipient of God's unfathomable and extravagant grace, Jonah now becomes the older brother, indignant that his enemies might be spared of death and judgment by a God of scandalous grace. Now, 
Admittedly, Jonah chapter 4 is not the most famous part of Jonah's story, but it is arguably the most important part of this entire Old Testament book. So we're going to dive further into this chapter, and we're going to organize our discussion of this text in three headings. Number one, we're going to talk about Jonah's rage. Number two, we'll talk about Jonah's suffering. Number three, we're going to talk about Jonah's gospel. So point number one, Jonah's rage. Right now in Wilmore, Kentucky, at the campus of Asbury University, students faculty, even people from out of town are driving in to participate in a non-stop gathering of worship and singing and praying and giving testimony and study of scripture. Many people have reported that this is a genuine revival, a genuine move of God, and I hope and pray that it is a revival. I pray that it would bear much fruit for the kingdom of God. But what you might not know is that the initial sermon that sparked this revival was simply a sermon that was given in a student chapel. The sermon itself did not convey any information or truth that was profoundly new or novel. Rather, it communicated a simple truth, that Christians are to love one another and that that love must flow from a genuine encounter with the love of God. From this moment, 10 days later, 24-7, this room has been filled with people who have gathered to worship Jesus and to encounter that love. Now, several days after this sermon was preached, I always imagine what it would feel like to be the man who preached this sermon that somehow led to this move. You would feel a wide array of emotions. One could imagine that such a preacher would feel amazed and humbled profoundly grateful that God would use him in this way to launch this type of move. But fascinatingly, that is not at all how Jonah the prophet feels at the beginning of our passage today. Remember, God has just used Jonah to ignite a citywide revival in the very heart of a wicked empire. The people of Nineveh have heard Jonah's words as if God was speaking to them himself. And they respond the people repent. God's divine judgment is stayed, but the prophet Jonah is incensed. Our text reads, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he said he would do to them, and he did not do it. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. Jonah burns with hot anger, because since the very beginning of this story, he never wanted to go to Nineveh. He never wanted to speak God's word to Nineveh, and he certainly didn't want the people of Nineveh to repent, to turn away from their evil, so that God might have mercy on them. And now the Lord God of Israel has used Jonah, an Israelite prophet, to show mercy to a nation of Israel's enemies. Jonah's flabbergasted. He says in verses 2 and 3, and he prayed to the Lord, O oh Lord, this is not what I said when I was yet in my country. This is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you're a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Jonah decides to tell God, this is why I ran away from you. This is why I did what I did at the beginning. I knew you would do something like this. Then he begins to list out God's attributes. He talks about his character and his nature. Now, this is something that scripture will do often. A lot of times this will happen actually in the book of Psalms, and it's almost always in the context of a song that's praising and worshiping God, declaring his goodness and his grandeur. But that's not what Jonah is doing here. He is not praising God. He is criticizing God. Jonah is saying, yeah, you're gracious, but your grace isn't good. You give grace to the wrong people, God. You give grace to wicked people who don't deserve it at all. Now, it's interesting, we should admit, that Jonah's all for God's grace when that grace is rescuing him from his own stupidity and sin, but it offends him to his core when God would give that same grace to his enemies. Remember, the Ninevites are a cruel 
and wicked people, and oppressive people that crush nations under their heel, torture them, maim them, murder. They deserve death and judgment. For God to show them mercy isn't just wrong in Jonah's mind, it is scandalous and it is unjust. The once wayward prophet who cried out to God to save him from the depths of his sin now stands in self-righteous judgment over the very God who saved him to the point that now he desires death. He desires death over life. I wonder, like Jonah, like the older brother of Jesus' parable, do you find it easy to become frustrated when God does not give you what you wanted or what you expected in life? You feel anger at God when he blesses someone else in a way that you feel like only you deserve. You feel like your obedience to God means that God is obligated to bend his will toward your will. If you have cried out in anger against God, I want you to know you're not alone. The Bible is, after all, a profoundly honest book. It is filled with prayers of anguish and sorrow and even rage. God's not taken aback by our tears, our fears, our anger. Nevertheless, he does not want to leave us in that place. And so God asks Jonah a simple question, a gentle question, but piercing nonetheless. And for a while, this question silences Jonah's accusations. The Lord said, do you do well to be angry? God is saying, Jonah, Is it just for you to accuse me of injustice? Can you possibly possess the infinite wisdom and knowledge required to question my decisions? Are you qualified to challenge me about what is good and what is true when I am the very essence of all that is good and all that is true? In fact, when Jonah is listing all the attributes that he now finds so detestable about God. He is not just making things up. He is quoting a passage from the Old Testament, specifically Exodus chapter 34. He is quoting a moment of scripture where God reveals the splendor of his glory as the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping his steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty. When Jonah accuses God of being too merciful, he's quoting scripture. However, did you notice that there was a part of that verse that Jonah very intentionally leaves out? Jonah talks about God's mercy, his grace, his steadfast love, his faithfulness, but he leaves out God's fierce dedication to justice. God has revealed himself to be a God that is compassionate, but he is also a God that is deeply committed to punishing evil. In fact, the Lord is so compassionate and he is so committed to punishing evil that he would send his own son to take the penalty for our sins on the cross so that we might receive mercy. However, Jonah refuses to see God for who he has revealed himself to be. Instead, Jonah sees God only in terms of his own bias and his own convenience. Moreover, Jonah is committed to hating his enemies, so committed that he refuses to see them as God would see them. See, this exposes something that's really a temptation and a tendency for all of us. We're so tempted to define good and evil based on what we want to be true, but God defines good and evil based on what is true. He's not just committed to justice. He is the foundation of all that is just and good. And that is why we can trust him. We can trust that our God has revealed himself to be a God who is infinitely wise, who is infinitely powerful, but who is also infinitely good. He is bending all things toward his glory and towards our ultimate good. And though we will indeed counter moments in life when the will of God seems frustrating and confusing and even enraging, we know that the end of our story is redemption and restoration. We know that the end of our story is grace. And that leads us to point number two. Jonah's suffering. Jonah responds to God's piercing question by giving God 
silent treatment. He actually never responds in this moment to God's immediate question. He doesn't repent for his hatred against Nineveh. He doesn't ask to be forgiven for mocking God's grace and his goodness. He simply goes outside of the city to sit and to wait. In the words of verse 5, see what would become of the city. You get the sense that Jonah's hoping that he has a front row seat to see the destruction of a people that he utterly hates. But if that doesn't happen, he is more than willing to simply wallow in his own bitterness and self-inflicted suffering. Now, just so you know, this is not your typical image of a prophet of the living God in the Bible. I mean, think about the prophets that occupy the pages of the Old Testament. We have the prophet Elijah, who confronts with great boldness a king of wickedness, and he calls down fire from heaven. We see this man, Isaiah, the mighty prophet, who sees the glory of the Lord high and lifted up. We have the prophet Daniel, who witnesses the mouths of lions being shut and beholds apocalyptic visions of God's glory and his kingdom. And then we have the prophet Jonah. How does the climax of his story come to a conclusion? Well, it's an image of a fully grown man dramatically pouting that he did not get his way. This isn't an image of a mighty man of God. This looks like an emo kid from the mid-2000s. Now, at this point, there is a really interesting word that appears all throughout the book of Jonah, and it now appears in this final scene several times. And it's an important word. And that word in Hebrew is ra'ah. It's a pretty flexible word that can mean evil. It can also mean disaster. It can also mean misery or discomfort. And in the book of Jonah, the word is used to convey all those meanings throughout the text. So the reason that God sends Jonah to Nineveh is because that their evil or their ra'ah had come up before him. When Jonah finally comes to Nineveh, he preaches the sermon. The king issues a decree that calls all people of Nineveh to turn away from their ra'ah. And as a result, God relents from the disaster or the ra'ah that he was going to pour out upon them. So by the time we get to Jonah chapter 4, Nineveh is all out of ra'ah. God is all out of ra'ah. But there's one character who's absolutely filled to the brim with ra'ah. And that is the character Jonah. When Jonah sees that God will stay his judgment upon Nineveh, he overflows with exceeding displeasure, exceeding ra'ah. In fact, he's not just filled with ra'ah, he's burning with it. And left unchecked, this ra'ah in Jonah's heart will poison him until he withers and dies. So, Just like God appointed a great fish to save Jonah from death in the first chapter, God now appoints a plant to save him from the raw, which is the bitterness in his heart. Verse 6 reads, Now the Lord our God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah so that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort or his raw. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. You see, Jonah's gladness, even his relief, are short-lived because God will also appoint a worm to attack and to kill the plant that is providing Jonah's shade. Then he immediately appoints a scorching wind and a burning hot sun that beats down on Jonah's head and brings him to a place of such weariness that Jonah is ready to die and he's finally ready to break his vow of silence before God. God again asks Jonah a question. You do well to be angry for the plant. Jonah said, yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. Now you see, the plant, the worm, the scorching east wind are not arbitrary or meaningless acts of God. God did not send the plant to appease Jonah or to make him comfortable, nor does he send the worm simply to make him miserable. God has given these visual images to expose and deliver Jonah from the deadly danger of his sin and the hatred that burns within his heart. Jonah again says that he wants to die. He's grieving the loss of this plant. And here the Lord will confront his prophet one last time. The Lord said, 
You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle? Now, I have to admit, that last phrase, and also much cattle, seems strange every time I read it. It's weird, right? It seems like such a strange and bizarre ending to such a fascinating book. But even more, we don't even get to see how Jonah's story ends. We don't know how Nineveh's story ends. We never even get an answer to the question. We are left only with a question. God is saying to Jonah, look, your heart is breaking for a non-sentient plant that has no soul, has no feelings, and a lifespan of about 24 hours. Am I not allowed to have my heart broken for more than 100,000 people who, though they are your enemies, they are nevertheless made in my image and likeness? Is my heart not allowed to break for them too? And if you're not willing to entertain mercy for the people of Nineveh, would you at least extend some pity for the animals in the same way that you are ready to have mercy and pity over this plant that died, a plant that you did not create, a plant that you do not sustain. See, it's a symptom of a bitter heart when we are easily able to find sympathy for pets and things and causes, but our hearts are callous and cold toward the suffering of people who simply we don't agree with, that we don't like, that we view as our enemies. The Lord reminds Jonah that the people of Nineveh They don't know their right hand from their left hand. They haven't been given the law of God. They have not been instructed in the words of Scripture. They don't even know God's name. And that's precisely why God has sent Jonah, his prophet, to them. In the same way, we shouldn't be surprised when the world does not think the way that we think or honor the words of Scripture the way we would want to honor the words of Scripture. We should not be offended or surprised when the world around us does not worship Jesus. But that is precisely why God has sent us, his people, to this time, this place, and this moment. Is that how you see the people around you, the people of your culture that do not yet know Jesus? When you see the people around you, the people of culture disregard the commands of God, do you see them as people who need to encounter and know the beauty of Christ? Do you simply see them as those you feel justified in hating? But our culture is lost. Our world is broken, you might say. Jonah would say, well, there's no one that's going to be more lost than the people of Nineveh. There's no more more wicked than the empire of Assyria. And the story reminds us, there is no one. There is no one beyond the reach of God's saving grace. Even more, I believe that the Lord's desire to save both the people and the cattle of this non-Israelite nation displays the magnitude of God's saving work and how it's so much bigger than what Jonah believes it to be. In this moment, God is showing that his saving grace isn't just for Jonah and it's not just for Israel. God's saving grace in the same way is not just for us as individuals and it's not just for American Christians. God's saving grace is an invitation to all people of all nations God's saving grace will one day renew creation. As we sing in the old Christmas hymn, joy to the world, the Lord is come. No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. See, God doesn't just want to end your suffering or our suffering. He intends to end all suffering. And it's in the light of that glorious hope, the hope of redemption, that allows us to let go of bitterness and hate. So in light of the hope of the gospel, in light of the day that is coming when all tears will be wiped away, are you willing to let go of the bitterness that poisons your heart, of the hatred that withers us and wearies us, 
So I have to tell you, your bitterness to those that have wronged you, to those that threaten you, it will accomplish nothing. But God's grace will one day make all things new. And that leads us to our final point, Jonah's gospel. As I said toward the beginning of the sermon, Jonah chapter four is not the most familiar part of Jonah's story, but it is arguably the most important part of Jonah's story. Many people think that the story of Jonah ends after the great fish saves him. Many people think that it ends after he preaches in the city of Nineveh. But actually, it's this final chapter that we find the point of the entire book. Jonah ends on a cliffhanger, just like the cliffhanger at the ending of Jesus' parable of the prodigal son. Because this final question is not just asking a question, it's an invitation. Jonah is invited to be set free of his preconceptions about who God is and who God is allowed to save. He's invited to be delivered from both his sinful rebellion and his sinful self-righteousness. He's invited to encounter the grace of God. But does he ever come around? Well, the words of Scripture actually never tell us, not for certain. Nevertheless, I believe that we have every reason to trust that Jonah did truly repent and come to embrace the life-changing grace of God. Why is that? Well, it's because the book exists. How else could we know the prayer that Jonah prayed from the belly of the well? How else could we know about Jonah's anger at God and how he hated the Ninevites so much in his heart? How else could we know of his sorrow over the plant and the exchange that God has between him answer is that Jonah had been so transformed by God's grace that he was willing to share the tale of how God saved him from his own foolishness, his own fear, and his own folly. How God has delivered him from his prejudice, his hate, and his bitterness. The book of Jonah is Jonah's confession. It testifies to the power of God who rescues the unlikely and the unworthy by the power of his grace. And it's important that Jonah's story was told. It testifies to something far beyond just Jonah. Because when the people of Jesus' day come to Jesus, they're asking him, give us a sign. Show us that you're the Savior. Show us that you are the promised one. Show us that you're the Messiah. Jesus tells them that the sign that they will be given is the sign of the prophet Jonah. Why did Jesus say this? Well, it's because ultimately the whole book of Jonah is not about Jonah. The whole book of Jonah points us to Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Savior, the true and the better Jonah. Jonah was cast into the waters of death because of his own rebellion against God, but Jesus is the greater Jonah who was cast into death on the cross because of our rebellion against God. Jonah lay within the figurative tomb of the fish for three days before he was delivered by God onto dry land. But Jesus is the greater Jonah, who laid within a literal tomb for three days and through the power of his resurrection, delivers us from the powers of sin and death. Jonah went from Israel to the nation of Assyria to preach a word of condemnation and judgment. But Jesus is the greater Jonah, who has been sent from heaven to earth, not to condemn the world, but to save it. Jonah sat outside of the city of Nineveh to judge his enemies. But Jesus is the greater Jonah, who died outside of the city of Jerusalem to reconcile his enemies to himself. Jonah cries out to God, my will, not your will be done. Jesus is the greater Jonah, who cries out, not my will, but yours be done. God sends a plant to die so that Jonah might let go of his hate and his sin, that God sends Jesus as the greater Jonah to die in our place, that we might receive his love and his righteousness. This is the scandal of the gospel, the scandal of God's amazing grace. And so, Redeemer Christian Church, my family, may we have eyes to behold the sign of the prophet Jonah. 
May we trust the wisdom of God when his will offends us or confuses us. May we let go of the bitterness that burns within us. May we marvel at the brilliance and the beauty of the gospel of grace that saves us. May we declare and display that gospel to the world that is around us. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are a God of extravagant grace. Thank you that you save us, but you don't only save us, you send us. Lord, I pray that as we bring the study of this Old Testament book to a close, that you would sign and seal the truth of these pages in our hearts. That you would reveal yourself to be a God that is so much bigger than we could ever think that you would show yourself to us to be a, a God that is so gracious and so kind to us, but that you do call us to extend that same grace to those that are around us, even those that are our enemies. So Lord, I pray that today you would heal us of our wounds and our anger, that you would let us let loose of the bitterness that might be ensnaring our heart. Lord, I do pray that we would be able to encounter your grace in such a way that as an overflow, we would extend that same grace to the world that is around us. We pray this 